But I just want to talk about that first half performance. Yes. With the quality and experience that was on the pitch for Real Madrid, yep. how can they have been so horrendous? Never seen such a... Well, for a long time I've not seen a team as dishevelled in such a big game. At no point when Barcelona were popping it around them at will, and they were... Every time they popped it out to the full-back and back into the centre-back, and then they got a quick ball into midfield, and they got in behind. They got round the corner, and before you know it, they were running at the back four. And by the way, and Stevie was talking about it during the game, and at that point, the Real Madrid full-backs are still trying to go forward, and then the centre-backs are getting exposed. But I couldn't believe the amount of space that were allowing Barcelona. In saying that, if that's happening, whether you're Real Madrid or any team at any level... Surely as experienced players, and particularly Casemiro, Cruz and Modric, say, listen, let's just come, right, let's just take a breather for five or ten minutes here and let's just figure this out. That never happened. So why didn't it happen? Because, as you say, these are top-level, world-class players who could have seen what was going on around them. Why didn't they take this, this step, step back? Well, there's two reasons. To there's usually two reasons, right? One is the players don't take the responsibility which is diabolical considering the experience they have. And the other one is the coach. The coach hasn't told them what he wants. And clearly, every time Madrid lost the ball, they were in absolute shambles defensively. They had players getting caught out of position everywhere. That tells me that the coach isn't telling them where to be in a situation. Or are they not listening? Well, and again, if you've got a bunch of experienced guys who are not taking responsibility, the chances are they're not listening to the coach. And if they're not listening to the coach, then you end up getting beat. And when you get beat 5-1 so easily, there's only one thing that's going to change. And you can't change all the players, but you can change the coach. Inevitably, the fact that Cristiano Ronaldo left in the summer is being brought up. And I think rightly so into this discussion, considering, of course, he scored two goals for Juventus yesterday. How much of a difference would he have made today? Or how much are we beyond that? I don't think it would have made much of a difference, if the truth be told, because a lot of the game was out of possession. A lot of the game, particularly in the first half, was out of possession for Real Madrid, and they struggled out of possession of the ball. Now, Varane goes off at half-time, he goes to a back three, makes some changes, and they have a, they have a good spell. I mean, it was a proper spell, I don't know, yep. 15 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever it was, mm. Bassa were on the back foot, and they did have opportunities. They scored, they had other opportunities. But then that quickly, that quickly disappeared. You know, you could say Valverde's had a nice balance about the team without Messi in it. I think you know, Rafinha's played particularly well, Arthur's played particularly well, Alba's been great going forward. But we're looking at a game that was 5-1 without Lionel Messi in the side, with the space that was there to operate. That amount of space, if he was operating, and this is hypothetical, in that space, it, it could have been... If this wasn't a murder, yeah. uh, you know, it could have been even worse. So, I mean, just the shape of the team, the heads went down... It's Lopetegui's worst nightmare. Barcelona didn't have to be brilliant to battle their, their biggest rivals. But I thought they played some, some good stuff, but it was open. Boy, it was open. Uh, let's bring Gab Marcotti into the conversation, shall we? Anyone who saw Friday's show would have seen Gab trying to champion Real Madrid's cause, talking about the fact it was only four points, and obviously they'd hit the post, maybe had been unlucky in some of those previous defeats. Uh, but in the end, Gab, obviously, uh, Real Madrid didn't do you too many favours. Well, just to knock this on the head, um, all I said was that a draw wasn't, wasn't as far-fetched as, as, as you people seem to think, and, and Sid Lowe agreed with me. And you know what? If that moderate shot goes in, or indeed the clear-cut chance that Benzema had at 2-2, maybe it becomes a different game, maybe it doesn't. Um, but it, it was quite interesting. Sergio Ramos, after the match, uh, you know, came out, and, and this is Sergio Ramos, remember, who really championed Lopetegui, mm -hmm. who, who was very much the conduit to getting Lopetegui from the Spain team uh, to Real Madrid just before the World Cup started. He came out afterwards and he said, well, you know, uh, sometimes you don't need a great tactician, you need somebody who knows how to handle players. And when, with Ramos coming out and saying that after the game, uh, I think we got the clearest hint yet that, uh, that, that changes afoot. In, in Madrid. This is what Lopetegui had to say after the game. Um, he's still fighting. Uh, you can certainly uh, not have a go in for not having a go, but take a look at what he had to say. Uh, we are feeling down, but I'm feeling strong. There's a tough blow, but I'm strong enough to know everything can be turned around. Um, he 
continue. There is a long way to go, and I have a lot of faith in this group of players. We have been punished a lot by injuries. I feel sad at the moment, but with full strength to remain in charge of this group. Obviously, well, well, you, you, you wouldn't expect well, anything else. He wants to turn it around. He had a chance in this game to stamp his authority on this team. Leading up to this game, they had been horrendous. They couldn't score, and they were throwing, throwing goals in. So then, you just don't keep doing the same, 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 same. You change it. You figure out a way of changing it. They had a game on Tuesday, and they didn't play till today. They had four days to get them on the training field and sort them out. And the first thing you do when you're losing is say, right, the first thing we're going to do is not get beat, and this is how we're going to do it. And then you change it. All right. Did absolutely nothing. He ratted through the same team out again, same setup, same tactics, and guess what? They got hammered. He had no option but to change it at half time. No option. This is not down to him, the change. And the change worked for what, 10 minutes, was it? 15 minutes? Yeah, it was all right. And then after that, it was back to the shambles. This guy's done absolutely nothing for Perez to even think of keeping him. And Sergio Ramos throwing him under the bus, pretty much. Well, it's funny, because Sergio Ramos, I, I think, uh, a couple of weeks ago, was actually backing. Yeah, and, and as Gav said, he was instrumental in getting him there in the first place. Yeah, it just shows you how the worm turns uh, when things go badly and everybody wants to point the fingers in different directions. He's gone. Yeah. You know, there's absolutely no doubt about it. How the hell do you lose the Spain job and the Real Madrid job in four months? <laughs> I mean, that takes some doing. <laughs> With the players that are on, on hold for, I know, the, I know the Spain job wasn't because of performance, it was because of other things, but this is just incredible. Just to go back to what, you know, what Gab was saying, you know, our chat on Friday is not really about predictions because, you know, everybody has a prediction. Sure. Predictions can go either way, you know, right or wrong. It's just, it's just the way the, the ball rolls sometimes in luck. I think the thing is, we were talking about last week, is, is there was clearly is there bigger problems behind the scenes when you look at results against the teams that they were playing against. And even going back to the Victoria Pills in Champions League game, which they won at a bit of a struggle in midweek against a team that really most other teams would probably be taking them for three or four minimum, was that things are not right behind the scenes because guys who are so technically gifted, even though they might be coming off a World Cup, even though they might be a little tired, but to take a team that is so technically gifted and turn them into a team that's struggling so much tells me that there's more behind the scenes than just, you know, the players are not playing well. The players are clearly not happy with what's going on. So let's take a look, shall we, the odds as who could come in and replace Lovatek. As we're going to air, he is still in charge, uh, by the way. Antonio Conte, uh, 8 to 15 on. Santi Solari currently in charge of the second team, 11 to 2. Arsene Wenger at 6s. Uh, then it's a long way out then to Pochettino at 13 to 1. Um, Gab. Ramos's comments after the game, obviously we're talking about maybe they were at Lopetegui. Is there not a part of it that maybe is at Conte as well, the possible signing of him? Because obviously a master tactician, man management, maybe there's been question marks over that in the past. Does Conte really fit this Real Madrid dressing room? It's interesting. There's two schools of thought on this, right? And, and a lot of times what happens in football, we see this all the time. When you go from... Uh, you go from one extreme to another when you change managers, right? So you get Lopetegui, who supposedly, you know, plays or played beautiful football, possession few football, moved the ball around, no reference points, but was perhaps, you know, a little bit, uh, a little bit laid back, a little bit, uh, a little bit detached from some, from some of the players. Uh, so now you want the opposite, right? So the opposite of Lopetegui can either go and mean, uh, you know, a real tough guy manager, uh, and that's why there, there's still school of thought that says, oh, wouldn't it be great if Mourinho came back? Uh, or indeed a guy like, like Conte, a disciplinarian, um, a guy who's going to crack the whip more than, than Lopetegui did. Uh, or the other school of thought says, well, you want a real players manager. You want somebody like Zinedine Zidane. It was pointed out to me that, uh, you know, on Saturday, if you watch the, the press conference, and obviously it was going to get heated and, and, and prickly, uh, uh, but Lopetegui, you know, he looked nervous. He looked. Uh, he he was he was bitter. You know, he he just looked all over the place. You know, contrast that with Zidane. And by the way, uh, Zinedine Zidane didn't always get great results uh, at Real Madrid. Certainly not in in La Liga in the time he was there. But Zidane was always calm, always diffused the situation. Mm. Uh, so there's a school of thought that says we want somebody calmer. We want a Zidane, an Ancelotti, uh, a, a Del Bosque, somebody who can always dial it, who can always find a way to dial things down. So it's almost like a, a philosophical choice that they're making right now. If they want the disciplinarian who might give you a short-term boost, obviously Conte is going to be your candidate or, or a candidate. 
if they want somebody perhaps a bit more laid back, a bit more of a player's manager, then since you can't go back to Zidane, or you might not want to, uh, then Santi Solari, who's in-house, who we all know is a very nice guy and a guy who knows a lot of football as well, we should, we should, uh, we should add, then, then he might be the candidate. Uh, quickly, boys, who would you have? If Antonio Conte would take it short term to the end of the season, and I don't know if he would, that's who I'd go for. Really? Yes. Not well, saying... Conte, absolutely. Yeah. 100%. Do you not think he would just upset everyone? Though? Not in the short term. No. no. I think maybe in the long term, but then again, they don't do long term managers anyway. It's 18 sure. months or two years and you're out. But I think, you know, he could go in there with his experience, organise, uh, still play a good style of football and, and sort the situation out short term. I, I think that would be perfect. If, I don't know if he'd do it. I don't know. Short term, Conte has structure. This team needs structure because right now they're all over the place. Last minute goal, they concede <laughs> their equaliser. But overall, Napoli thoroughly deserved that. Well, they had a lot of the play and uh, they created some chances. They took Milic off, uh, Milic off and brought uh, Mertens on, who is a good player and he's lively. But I have to say, the one thing Roma have struggled with when I've watched them uh, over the piece uh, is defence. And, yeah. and the, for one time, the defence stood strong. Manolas had to go off injured. And his centre-half partner, uh, Jesus, was... You think he's a rather big chap. He's rather large. But he actually defended very he's well. So they, they'll be delighted on the road getting a point. But with the possession that Napoli had, I think Ancelotti will be disappointed with the final third. It is a strange one for Roma because if you look at the play, no question, Napoli controlled it. If it had been a boxing match, I mean, it would have been over in points by a mile. Mm. But the truth is, Roma could have been, they, they could have been three up. Jekyll's, Jekyll's walked around the goalkeeper and not finished it off. Yeah. He should have had a penalty. I mean, they could have had three goals legitimately. Uh, legitimately. What? There you go, no, there you go. That's easy for me to say. <laughs> but at the end of the day, Napoli deserve to get something because as a football team, they were far better. Your thoughts, Gab? Uh, no, I, I subscribe to what, what the boys said. Um, I think in some ways, uh, you know, going into it, uh, this game was, was described as, some, as a game that Di Francesco needed to win or at least put in a, a convincing performance. Uh, I don't think the performance was convincing. Napoli were, were a far better side. That one, notwithstanding, had they got that penalty, had Roma somehow uh, you know, gotten the three points, uh, it would have taken a ton of pressure off of him. Instead, mm. the screws continue to turn. Meanwhile, earlier in the day, what a game it turned out to be. Milan taking on Sampdoria. Uh, Gab, this was a massive win. Big win for Gattuso, wasn't it? It really was. You got so emotional uh, at the end. Got into, got into a row with the fourth official, for which he later, uh, he later apologized. Uh, look, he got bold and he was rewarded. You know, the, the switch to the four-four-two, playing Cutrone with with Higuain up front, which you know people said wouldn't work. Well, Cutrone maybe doesn't work so much when he's out on the wing, but when it's a proper two up front, uh, it can work. Laxalt and Suzo out wide. Uh, again, people said Suzo couldn't play midfield in a four. Well. Um, he showed that on this game, you know, he certainly can if, if he works hard. So I, I think there, there's some lives left in, uh, in, in Gattuso yet. Welcome into Extra Time. Thank you for your tweets. Worst El Clasico you've ever watched in terms of Real Madrid's performance? Uh, Pretty dire. I'm not a... You know, I was glad I wasn't working for Real Madrid TV well, today. Well, you've probably seen more than me. But, um, I don't know historically if there's been any... how many bad score lines have been, but... It got pretty bad yeah. at times. It's been yes. five before. Two years ago they got blasted. Yeah, they got blasted, blasted before. I was at the Bernabeu when Ronaldinho scored those goals and he got pulled it off. But that was brilliant from him as opposed to rubbish from Madrid. So, yeah, pretty bad. Gab, where's our Clasico you've watched from Real Madrid's perspective? Uh, this is pretty bad, but at least you had a, you had a few minutes of, of hope in, yeah. in, in the second half. I, I'm thinking the original Manita, or it might not have been the original, but the one, the one we remember in, uh, during the Pep Jose Wars. Yeah, there was no hope then, was there? Yeah. By the way, it was still a great, I mean, as it always goes, was going to be, without Messi and obviously Ronaldo's gone. Yeah, that was weird that people were saying oh, it won't be the same. Was, I mean, it was still... still Real Madrid Barca. Just the, oh. way, the way that they passed it around when they were having the good periods, particularly Barcelona, was, was still, yeah. was still uh, great to watch. How was Jordi Alba not in the Spain squad, by the way? Wow. He was superb, wasn't he? Um, why is Bale even considered a good player when the fact is he's average at best? Had one great season with Spurs where he didn't win anything, hasn't done anything with Madrid for years, 
scores occasional Wondell goals, zero consistency. Well, let, let me just say, Gareth Bale is not an average at best player. Right? He is a super player who, along with a lot of others, oh, and by the way, he scored a great goal in the Champions League final. He's got three, three Champions League yeah. winners. He's been to the semi-final of a Euros with a, with a Welsh team that had really no business to be there. Amongst all the other things he's done, he's, he's having a, a bad time at the moment and he's not alone in a white jersey. He's not average, is no. he? No. <laughs> he's not average. He's not average at all. Not even close to it. Is Arthur the best summer signing? If he continues to play the way he is right now for the rest of the season, then yes. At the moment, it's just a great spell. Somebody gets in the team, you know, the, every game is exciting for them. Yep. You know, it, it's when all those things calm down and, and then the norm becomes you have to be at this level. But so far, absolutely, he's been fantastic. What do you think, Gap? Well, I think one big sign of, of how highly Van Verde uh, rates Arthur is that, you know, the, the, condition, the continued transition to a 4-4-2 is there to essentially accommodate him, right? Because he's not going to drop Rakitic or, or Busquets. And then on top of that, uh, of course, that went even further with, uh, with the transition to, to a 4 5 one you want to call it that, against Real Madrid. So I'd say he's quickly becoming pivotal, especially, you know, after Rakitic had that long season. Uh, Busquets not getting uh, uh, any younger either. So his fresh legs and, and, and his passing, have, uh, I think, are very important to, uh, to Barcelona. What was the worst loss you ever had as a professional? Uh. <laughs> the one that stands out? Oh, yes. Goals-wise? Oh. Yeah, I imagine goals-wise, yeah. Oof. Craig, I think oh, I'll, I'll defer. Blackburn Rovers. My memory serves me correctly. Beat us. I was at Sheffield Wednesday. Right. And it was 7 2 we got beat. I was actually, I started on the bench. And it was actually a 3 0 after 20 minutes. And I'm sat on the bench, and David Plate was the man who gave it one of them. <laughs> I went like, oh. <laughs> Not the call you want. Like three 0 No. Obviously made a difference. Yes, they only can see what four. That was good too. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was slightly better because I, I came <laughs> off the bench as well. Right. There's a different stage in my career because I was a youngster and I was making my. I think it was my league debut at Nottingham Forest. And Bobby Campbell who God rest his soul, he's not long, no longer with us. Decided to, decided to bring me on at 5 0 or 5 1 down. Lovely. And we lost seven. <laughs> <laughs> what a debbie that is. Lovely, lovely moment to uh, enter the field. Uh, finally, Gav, where is Latta most likely to go if he indeed exercises his loan option in the MLS break? Wow. Um, what does feel? I genuinely don't know. I, I, I think, you know, a lot of the, there have been suggestions of a return to, to Manchester United as some sort of a, a short-term boost. I don't really see that happening. I, I think that would be kind of, you know, yet another potential cat among the pigeons. Uh, he's been linked to Real Madrid. People have obviously, uh, people remember when Adebayor came in, uh, sort of in, in, in mid-season. Um, but, I, listen, I think a lot's going to depend on, on the terms, on how long they can get him for, because, you know, if you're just going to pick somebody up for, for two, three months, uh, is it worthwhile? I think, as far as Real Madrid is concerned, obviously they want to sort out their, their manager situation mm. first before they even contemplate Slata. No disrespect, Slata, if you're watching. Tell them the one when you were in the bar. You got a call when you're a paint you know. We've heard the story. Oh, that story. Oh, story. Yeah. Oh, that was, was your my... professional debut. Wasn't that was, it? Yeah, I think the Forest was my league debut. I think this was my professional debut. Yeah. Against Swindon Town and the old. We used to have many cup competitions in the house. Uh, yeah. Too many cup competitions. Yeah. And uh, yes. You didn't think you were playing in the bar? Well, I wasn't. I didn't, didn't think about it. Yeah, I wasn't playing. I played for the reserves the day before, uh, uh, and so I wasn't playing. And I was in the, the players' lounge. In those days, we would have beers, and I had a couple of pints of beer. 
and I was eating some... <laughs> what else would it be? Well, pints of what? I was eating some crisps, which you call chips, <laughs> here, and uh, the door burst open and Eddie Nisveski, who was the coach, uh, said, get yourself in the dressing room, you're playing. <laughs> At which point I, I flew in, I was like, what, what were we talking about? And I, I went in and Ian Porterfield was a manager who's also, he's, he's no longer with us, and I said to him, I said, Tell boss, what, what's the common denominator here? I said, what is Koji that hasn't dropped off? I said, boss, I've been on the beer, I can't, he said, yeah, you'll be all right, son. Yeah. You'll be, and I said, I played in the reserves the day before, 90 minutes. He went, you'll be all right, son. And I got changed and I played. And were you all right? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I got cramp after about 30 minutes. <laughs> Uh, that is it. ESPN FC back tomorrow. It's Don't advocate drinking in the bar before no. games. Okay, there we go. Good. <laughs> uh, what's up? Spurs City, isn't it, tomorrow? Okay, let's have a little look back over the weekend in the Premier League and see how it's all shaping up as we get into the business end of the season. Obviously, on Saturday, Liverpool kept up the pressure in their excellent start to the season with a very comfortable win over Cardiff. Looking at one or two of the other teams, Bournemouth under Eddie Howe, still going strong and a way win uh, at Fulham and a convincing win at that. And Watford, after a little stumble, got back to winning ways. But more importantly, Sunday's Premier League games and the big teams involved. Arsenal with 11 straight wins, that winning streak is over. But on a positive note, the unbeaten streak continues. It was 2-2, it was disappointing in the end. But when Granite Xhaka gave that penalty away, the inevitable Zag, Zaha against a player out of position was always a danger. And so that's a disappointment from Unai Emery and Arsenal's point of view, but it has been a great run. And I think a little bit back down to earth with one or two who were saying, are Arsenal in the title race? Arsenal, in my opinion, were never in this title race. As good as that run was, if they get in the top four, it's been a great season. Chelsea... Well, they are looking strong under uh, Maurizio Sarri. I know Burnley have not been a, a great side this year, but they completely demolished them. They all, and also they demolished them without their main man, Aidan Hazard. I was surprised to see Maratta start. He got himself a goal, missed a host of other chances. Not great for the confidence. The big story is Ross Barkley. Barkley, excellent in midfield. He's fit. Sarri clearly likes him. We know he's got talent. And all of a sudden, this guy looks at home at a big club like Chelsea and performing very, very well. He's going to be one to watch going forward. A good response from Man United wasn't the greatest performance against a decent Everton side. It was a good win. Pogba with the, the rebound off the penalty and then the informer Anthony Martial with a great goal. He might have added to that. But bearing in mind they were pretty atrocious against Juventus. It was a close game in scoreline, but it wasn't a close game in performance. This was a good response. It takes a little bit, a small bit of pressure off Jose Mourinho uh, looking forward. So that was a good three points. So all in all, it's shaping up nicely. I think the top three will be fighting it out. Uh, I don't see Arsenal or Tottenham getting in there. I see Man United's efforts trying to get in the top four. That battle will be with Arsenal. But boy, those top three at the moment, they're playing some good football. Well, was this going to be a great occasion without Messi and Ronaldo? Well, you bet your bottom dollar it was. What a fantastic game, particularly if you're a Barcelona fan at the camp now. Two great sides. Uh, one side obviously having its trouble at the moment and one side who's been coached particularly well, it seems, Barcelona under Valverde. Let's have a look at the two coaches. No Messi uh, recently. He's had to find the right balance, Valverde. He's done that particularly well in the games against Sevilla, where Messi went off in the game against Inter Milan where they won and played well, and in a game again today where they even upped that performance in the biggest game in Spain, and they were excellent. A couple of things to look at. Luis Suarez, you know, Luis Suarez, how he leads the line. Luis Suarez, how he links up. Luis Suarez, how he makes runs. Sort of is the epitome of everything about Barcelona. Many think about Suarez, well, you know, he's got Messi in there, so it's a big help. Of course it is. But he's proven what a world-class footballer he is today without the little genius in the team. He got three goals, he could have had himself five goals. Arthur played well, look, Rafinha played well in there, Busquets looks more like his old self. And yes, Barcelona will give you some chances. We know they're not perfect at the back, but they're certainly well drilled enough in all other areas that they're strong enough. They can compete and compose themselves when the game is going against them. Let's have a look in the white corner of Real Madrid where Julian Lopetegui at the moment, Lopetegui looks as if Quite frankly, he, he's just clueless. He's got all these big stars, these World Cup winners, these guys that have been over the course, they've seen it and they've done it, and they're all over the place. The front line's not operating well. 
the midfield's not closing down or even keeping the ball. Modric's giving it away. Casemiro giving it away. Cruz giving it away. Unheard of in the last couple of years. These guys have been so efficient. Not close to making a challenge. You've got fullbacks charging up field and leaving the, the back line exposed and Barcelona getting in there. You've got Ramos making mistakes, probably more than ever, and he got cut out badly right at the end of the game. It was just a shambles from Real Madrid from start to finish. It was 5-1, and I know Real Madrid got a little bit on the second half when they made a change, and there was a change of shape, and they got a goal back, and there was a little bit of pressure, but really and truly, they were never in this game. Barcelona were superb, and to sum it up, Real Madrid were a shambles. Pochettino's first job is finding a way to stop Manchester City playing out from the back, playing through the thirds and getting it into their front players with quality. Because Manchester City at the moment are doing lots of different things to get it into those front areas. At times, although they're playing with a back four, they end up playing with a back three when they're in possession. The right-sided uh, fullback comes in to make a back three. Mendy goes forward down the left-hand side, and quite often Edison just chips the ball out to him, and they start their attacks from there. Because the left-sided winger takes the fullback back, so Mendy's got a lot of space. Then against Shakhtar, the Nets, they did it in a totally different way. The two centre-halves split, Laporte and, and Otamendi. Fernandinho drops in between the two centre-halves and the two full-backs who were Stones and Mendy went into holding midfield positions and if they were pressed they had easy balls out to the wide players, Mares down one side and Sterling down the other. It was really difficult to play against and if Spurs do want to go and press high up the field and stop Edison passing it out to his back players, Manchester City are the best side at the moment, are chipping the ball into the front areas, one of the wide players coming off the touchline and suddenly they are on the halfway line, three against three or four against four causing the opposition problem. So Pochettino has got to get his tactics defensively absolutely right. He's also got to hope that Alderweireld and Sanchez have good games. I've been disappointed with those two this season. A couple of years ago, I thought Alderweireld was probably the best centre-half in the Premier League. But he's, since his injury, since he's had his problems with the manager over his flirtation with Manchester United, he hasn't looked the same player. His recovery runs are sluggish. And Sanchez, who had a good season last year, has proved that he doesn't read danger quite quickly. And against the Man City side, with probably Aguero in the side, and David Silva making forward runs, and if it's Kevin De Bruyne making forward runs, he's not just got to be a man marker, he's got to read danger. That was highlighted against Barcelona when Messi kept on coming in the field, playing balls in behind him, and Suarez kept on making runs. Everybody in the stadium could see it was going to happen. Me as a commentator was almost saying it two or three seconds before it was happening. Sanchez didn't read it. If Pochettino can stop Manchester City dominating the game and get his defensive game plan right, then he'll try and expose the space in behind Mendy when he's playing high up the field and down the side of Laporte. And if Stones is playing on the right-hand side, I still think he has problems. Now, Walker may come into the side, but Stones has problems when he's got a big area to cover. He's not a great athlete and people can get at him. So there are problems with Man City. You can win the ball in the right sort of areas, as Liverpool have proved in previous matches. If you can win the ball back in the right areas and counter-attack them at pace, their defenders don't always make good decisions. If Spurs can get anything out of the game, it would be a great endorsement of Pochettino's coaching credentials.